right. All right, well, it is 8 o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, welcome everybody to our medical grand rounds. Uh, it is another um, delight to be here and to have our second in our series of dream speakers. Uh, we have asked our residents to choose each class to choose a res uh, uh, a guest speaker of their choosing to invite um, for Grand Rounds. And so today to introduce our dream speaker, I have Dr. Adam Stepanovich uh, is one of our residents. So, Adam. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Schnapp. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Rich Sellers who was chosen by our second chair internal medicine residency class to speak today as part of our dream speakers dream speaker series uh, dr zellers is the chair of the department of radiation oncology at Indiana university and physician chief of cancer services at the simon cancer center dr zellers went to medical school at johns hopkins university and completed his residency and chief residency at the university of michigan in addition to his current role at the indiana university he is adjunct faculty at Johns Hopkins as an associate professor of radiation oncology and has previously held several professorship positions at UT Science Health Center in San Antonio and Georgetown University. He specializes in the care of breast cancer and gynecologic malignancies and has multiple grant funded research projects that aim to improve the safety and efficacy of radiation therapy for breast cancer. Over the years, Dr. Zellers has actively worked to improve the care of breast cancer patients on a national level, including as the co-chair of the National Cancer Institute Task Force for Breast Oncology with Local Disease. He has also received numerous teaching awards and has been named a top doctor by multiple national organizations. He has been an amazing role model to learners of all levels, from organizing tours of basic science research labs for inner city children to mentoring residents and PhD students. Dr. Zellers is the founder and co-director of the CUPID program, which stands for Cancer in the Underprivileged, Indigent, or Disadvantaged. This summer research program, which I was able to participate in after my first year of medical school, is meant to promote the discipline of oncology to medical students who are interested in caring for the medically underserved. The program allows students to participate in a basic lab science research project and features a series of seminars about healthcare disparities in oncology. During my time in the program, Dr. Zellers facilitated a trip to Washington, D.C. to advocate for a healthcare bill that would provide coverage for longitudinal cancer care planning from diagnosis to long term survivorship. So, needless to say, Dr. Zellers has influenced me and many other learners to pursue a career in oncology. Dr. Zellers has a wealth of experience as a clinician, educator, advocate, and role model and has a prominent interest in the care of the medically underserved. I'm so excited and so grateful that Dr. Zellers is able to give this talk to the Department of Medicine today. So please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Zellers. Wow, Adam, thank you so much. That is, that is a very kind and generous introduction. Um, it is my uh, pleasure and honor to speak to you all today. Um, about um, some of the work that I've been lucky enough to do. Um, so let's get started. Let's see. Just uh, hit focus on your PowerPoint. There we are. So again, it is an honor to speak to you all. I will talk to you today about cancer and the underprivileged, indigent, and disadvantaged Cupid Summer Fellowship. I have no disclosures, but before we talk about Cupid, I'd like to review some information um, about what led us to start this program. When we talk about cancer, we typically talk about the big four, prostate, breast, lung, and colon. These big four will be responsible for about 250,000 deaths this year. But there is some good news. You can see in these charts that the mortality is decreasing over time. On the left, we have a chart looking at all sites, male, 
and female, and we can see that the curves are trending down. On the right, we have curves for each of the diseases, again, separated by male and female, and we can see that the curves are trending down. This is a great slide showing how well we have done. The red represents what the expected mortality would have been based on historic history. The blue represents actuality. So according to the American Cancer Society, due to our advances in cancer care, we've avoided 1.8 million cancer deaths in men and 800,000 in women. This works out to approximately a 30% reduction in the annual mortality in the last 25 to 30 years. That is great. But how much should we celebrate? This is Harold Friedman. Harold Friedman is considered the father of cancer patient navigation. As a young surgeon in um, Harlem, he recognized that his patients needed some additional help navigating the healthcare system, navigating their care to get the full benefit of our cancer advances. Dr. Friedman wrote, there is a critical disconnect between what we discover and what we deliver, between what we know and what we do for all people. It is critical to accurately define which groups of Americans suffer a heavier burden of cancer, determine the causes, and apply interventions to eliminate the disparities. But what are those disparities of which he speaks? This is another chart from the American Cancer Society. On the left is the incidence, on the right is the mortality of several cancers by race and ethnicity. I was going to spend a great amount of time going through this chart in great detail, but I decided to take another approach. But I also decided to leave the slide up because, you know, it's really not a grand round lecture until someone presents a slide that's completely incomprehensible in the five seconds that we have to review it. Here are survival curves for African American and white. The African American in red, the white population is in gray. And as you can see quite clearly that there's a difference in survival rates between the two populations with the African-Americans doing much worse. It's not just African-Americans who appear to be doing poorly when compared to their white counterparts. On the left, this is, represents the five-year cost-specific survival rates for Hispanics, the Hispanics in orange, the non-Hispanic whites in gray. And as you can see, the Hispanics appear to be doing worse than their whites in many of these diseases. However, when you look at the female population, it seems that they may be doing a little bit better. This is what the American Cancer Society calls the Hispanic paradox. And they give, they recommend significant caution reviewing their Hispanic data because um, their data on ethnicity is not very strong and, and problematic. In fact, they say really their best data is simply looking at black versus white. The Hispanic paradox is the thought that the, the appearance that the Hispanics appear to do better in survival in some diseases, even though they are much more associated with a lower socioeconomic status, which doesn't quite make sense. But differences and disparities aren't limited to race and ethnicities. There are other marginalized groups that suffer disparities when it comes to cancer. If we look at the LGBTQ community. There is anal cancer in about 1.5, 1.5 per 100,000 heterosexual men are diagnosed with anal cancer. Homosexual men who are HIV negative, it's 5.1 per 100,000, but it's 45 per 100,000 in homosexual men who are HIV positive. Interestingly, there appears to be a discrepancy with regards to skin cancer where homosexual and bisexual men have a slightly higher rate of skin cancer than their heterosexual counterparts. And with regards to breast cancer, there is literature to suggest that bisexual women and lesbians have a higher rate of breast cancer than their heterosexual counterparts. All those literature, all the literature in this category does vary. So how and why did this come to be? Is it really just based on biology? Is there something inherently different about the biology of 
say, African Americans and whites, which explains this difference. Well, here's a study that has taken the biology tag. This is ECONF, ECONF, ECOG Akron Z171. The researchers who put together this study had previously recognized that African American women have a much higher rate of chemo induced neuropathy than white women. And they also found that there might be a germline mutation which correlates with this um, increased rate of chemo induced neuropathy. So, what they did is they put together a study that's just for black women. This is rare. And in, these, in this study, these women will receive two different types of chemotherapy, and they will be followed for, the, for chemo induced neuropathy, and they will see if they can validate the germline finding. So this is a great study. It makes sense. It's based on previous findings. I support this study. But we have to remember, race is a social construct. There is little biology to justify separating people by race. And here's a couple of really good examples. This is a great study um, from Kathy Albany, looking at racial disparities in cancer survival among um, patients in randomized clinical trials in the Southwest Oncology Group. She looked at almost 20,000 adult cancer patients treated on phase three trials. And as you all know, phase three trials are our gold standard. Patients are randomized, thereby theoretically removing all biases. And they're all received the same prescribed care per the trial. Patients were grouped by stage and disease and they were controlled for education and income. What did she find? Well, she did find that survival was worse for African-American, especially with regards to early stage breast cancer, advanced ovarian and advanced prostate cancer. However, there was no significant difference in survival between African-Americans and other groups with lung and colon, two of the big four, lymphoma, leukemia, or myeloma. So the results of this study argue that you know, biology alone may not be the source of these healthcare disparities. Evidence exists elsewhere. Again, we return to the survival curves um, for um, black and white populations. Again, as you've seen before, the survival curves or the mortality curves, I should say, are decreasing over time. African-Americans appear to be doing worse so, than their white counterparts. But I also want to point out that it appears that the curves are converging. So with the expectation that over time they will meet, it is unlikely that biology is changing very much in say 30 years to justify this convergence. So therefore I think it may be more than just biology. IOM thinks the same and has identified these three factors as being um, the factors that influence the cancer continuum. Economic issues, social issues, and cultural issues, which influence prevention, early detection, diagnosis, incidence, treatment, post-treatment quality of life, survival, and mortality. Others use these three categories, which are very similar. Culture, low socioeconomic status, poverty, social injustice, or looking at people through the lens of race or racism. Well, how does poverty influence outcomes? Those living in poverty are less likely to have significant education, unhealthy environment, risky habits, and activities, and tend to be uninsured. But this is all race and ethnicity independent. Lack of education is really significant health care disparities associations. For example, in a population of people who have less than 12 years of education, so this is less than completing or graduating high school, for adults 18 to 65, there are 615 deaths per 100,000 people. That 615 decreases by two thirds if they have more than a high school diploma. Education is linked to insurance. 40% of those without a high school diploma are uninsured. More than 60% of the uninsured are in low-income families. 
here's a great graphic of the lack of insurance issue in this country and how it's linked to education. The dark blue represents 35 to 50 percent of the population without insurance. The light blue represents 0 to 15 percent of the population without insurance. So the lighter the color, the more people that are, are insured. And this first upper left hand corner, this chart represents all those without a high school diploma. And as you can see, it is quite dark, representing a very high rate of no insurance. Next, upper right hand side are those with a high school diploma. And we can see that the rate of insurance is increasing. Lower left, these are, this is the population with a college degree. Lower right, with some graduate school degree. So as education increases, the rate of insurance increases. When asked what is the reason for not having insurance, the number one reason, as you all can probably surmise, is coverage is not affordable. So it's a financial reason. And in the lower right here, we see that the rate of insurance or the uninsured rates um, tend to be higher in our most vulnerable populations. So why am I making a point about insurance? Is insurance really that important? We have Medicaid, we have safety net hospitals. The accommodations may not be as pleasant in, in other well-funded hospitals, but the care should be appropriate and okay, and people should do all right. So does insurance really matter? You betcha. In this chart, we look at um, outcomes by insurance. The green represents private insurance, the black represents Medicaid, and the red represents the uninsured. And what we can see, or what they've shown quite clearly, is that those with private insurance have significantly better survival with regards to breast cancer, cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer when compared to those with Medicaid or uninsured. Let's turn our attention to culture. How does culture influence outcomes in oncology? Well, it's important to remember that culture is not equal to race. Culture here is used for a population that has sort of a shared communication system, shared physical and social environment, shared beliefs, values, lifestyles, behaviors, and even worldview. Dr. Freeman has a great example he uses to illustrate the importance of culture. He compares Harlem, New York to Harlem, Kentucky. So in Harlem, New York, the population is 90% black. The median income is approximately 29,000. In Harlem, Kentucky, the population is 91% white. The median income is approximately 16,000. Now, if you adjust that for New York City, that would be about 31,000. However, even though these two populations are quite different, they have common habits, heavy tobacco use, heavy alcohol use, and heavy ingestion of animal fats. And consequently, both communities have significantly higher cancer mortality rates than the US average. So these are completely different groups. One is primarily black, urban, northern, the other is primarily white, rural, and southern. But because of these habits, they have similar outcomes. Culture can be expressed in just beliefs. In this really interesting study, Margulis and all looked at surveyed patients at the Philadelphia VA. Margulis found that 61% of African Americans and 30% of whites believe that lung cancer tumors spread when exposed to air. We've all heard this old wives' tales from our patients. And many of us just sort of laugh it off, but it's not so funny when you think about almost 20% of African American and 10% of whites oppose surgery based on this belief. So because of this erroneous belief, people are opposing treatments that could potentially, potentially cure them of their disease. But perhaps the most pernicious and influence um, factor on, on cancer outcomes are social injustice or looking at people through the lens, lens of race. 
we all must accept and recognize that we are all, all of us, socialized and acculturated long before we're educated. And those factors influence our decision and can cause us to make false assumptions about an individual or a group of individuals, which can lead to racism or placing people in some sort of cats. Really painful example of that is this in this study here. This is a study which was published last year. It's entitled Physician Patient Racial Concordance in Disparities in Birthing Mortality for Newborns. And it's a very interesting study. The researchers looked at 1.8 million hospital births in Florida between 1992 and 2015. Almost 10,000 physicians were identified to be associated with these births. They actually looked up these physicians, these 9,992, and racially profiled them. They were actually able to find um, or make decisions about more than 8,000 of these numbers. They then controlled the data for insurance, comorbidities, type of hospital, and year. What did they find? When they looked at infant mortality based on the concordance of racial concordance between the physician and the infant, they had some very interesting results. First, if it were a white doctor and a white infant, there were 290 infant deaths per 100,000. If it were a white doctor and a black infant, it jumped to 720 per 100,000 which is huge. However, if it were a black doctor and a black infant, it decreased to 473, 463. And just for completion, if it were a black doctor and a white infant, there was no different, difference, significant difference in the outcome for that white infant when compared to white doctor and white infant. Now, many would say, well, the black infants are tend to be in um, from lower socioeconomic families, and they tend to go to more uh, safety net hospitals. And the outcomes at those hospitals don't tend to be as great in, in the other hospital. And that is a criticism. But those black physicians worked in those same hospitals, so were under the same stressors with regards to those black infants, and did much better. This. Does this mean that these white doctors went to work with ill feelings towards black infants? I think this is an example of implicit bias in a very um, clear way. The next paper I'll present is an example of how explicit bias influences, can influence cancer outcome. This is a paper by Nancy Krieger, who is a, um, prolific, um, well-regarded social epidemiologist, at, and she's a full professor at Harvard. She wrote a paper on, um, on Jim Crow, and this is Jim Crow and estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, U.S. born black and white non-Hispanic women between 1992 and 2012. What she did, she looked at SEER registry data and identified 47,000 U.S. born black women 348,000 U.S. born non-Hispanic white women between the ages of 25 and 84 who had primary breast cancer between 1992 and 2000, um, 2012. She then compared ER status, negativity or positivity, with place of birth, so whether the women were born in Jim Crow states or non-Jim Crow states. There were 21 Jim Crow states plus the District of Columbia. And as you know, in Jim Crow states, discrimination was legalized. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't racial discrimination in the non-Jim Crow states. There certainly was. But in the Jim Crow states, it was codified into law. What did Dr. Cryer find? Well, she found that Jim Crow state births were associated with an increased rate of ER negative in African-American women when compared to 
um, African American women born in non Jim Crow states. So let me say that again. If you were an African American woman born in a Jim Crow state, you were more likely to have ER negative breast cancer, which we know portends a worse outcome, than an African American woman born in a non Jim Crow state. Dr. Krager went on further to show that when she compared the difference between African American and white women, she found a significant difference with regards to ER negativity. In other words, African American women in Jim Crow states had a greater likelihood of having ER negativity when compared to their white counterparts in the same states than African American women born in non Jim Crow states. Dr. Krieger concludes that this Jim Crow effect for U.S. Black women for ER status underscores why analyses of racial and ethnic inequities must be historically contextualized. So here there is a problem, right? And we need doctors and others to fix this problem. But this is complicated by the fact that maybe there are not enough doctors. Here's some stats from ASCO. Here's a map of the United States, and each of those white squares represent counties in the United States where there are no oncologists, zero. In fact, it is estimated that 15 to 20 percent of the U.S. population lives in these rural areas that are only served by about 3 percent of our oncologists. I want to point out something else here. When we look at diversity in oncology, only 3% of the oncologists are Black or African American. Four or close to 5% are Hispanic or Latino. And only a third are women. This shortage is only likely to get worse. Here's a paper predicting the shortage up until 2025. The blue line represent, represents the oncology demand. The green represents the oncology demand with, at the time, the new Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. The yellow represents oncology supply. And over time, you can see how the demand and supply curves are diverging. So when, you can, when we considered the healthcare disparities that exist today, and some of the reasons for those healthcare disparities, and the need for more doctors generally, we decided to pursue the program, which we now call CUPID. CUPID stands for, as Adam nicely said earlier, Cancer in the Underprivileged, Indigent, and Disadvantaged Summer Fellowship. Um, I started this program 16 years ago at Johns Hopkins, and I spent, I think, like three days trying to figure out a good acronym. Here's a picture of Johns Hopkins. It's a little old data, but I like it. Here's the Famous stone, and down here is our cancer center. This is a new cancer tower, just beyond that. This is Marty Abeloff. Marty Abeloff was a wonderful human being. He was the director of the cancer center when I returned as a young um, faculty member, assistant professor in 2001. Marty pulled me over one day while at the cancer center and said, Hey, Rich, you know, there's there's a shortage of minority oncologists. Can you think of something that we at Hopkins can do to help that? And then he left. I mean, that was that was it. He kind of just got this, this small homework assignment. Um, so I went home and I thought about what what to do. What are the goals? What would be the goals of such a program? Now, certainly a program trying to get greater representation in oncology is important. And there are many programs about doing that. But I wanted my program, I had slightly a different ultimate goal. My ultimate goal was to provide good care to those people who are not receiving it. So with that being my ultimate goal, I didn't care as much as who was delivering the care, the care as much as the quality of the care that was being delivered. So I went back to Marty and I said, hey, I've got an idea. This is a, a program I want to do and I want to open it to all medical students, irregardless of, regardless of uh, race or ethnicity, which was a little bit controversial because when you immediately think healthcare disparities programs, we immediately think of minority students. 
And so Marty said to Rich, he said to me, he said, so Rich, so if you have five white guys who sign up for this program, what are your thoughts? And I said, that would be great. That just meant there were five more people who were interested in learning how to care for these underserved populations. So with that, Cupid was born. The mission of Cupid was to promote the discipline of oncology among medical students interested in caring for or understanding the needs of underprivileged, indigent, or disadvantaged people. Um, one of the great things about putting this talk together is I got to dig up a lot of old pictures from our previous classes, so they'll be spread throughout the remainder of the talk. The Cupid program was a summer fellowship. It was seven weeks and it was for rising second year medical students. So the summer between your first and second year of medical school. Students from any medical school in the US or US territories could apply. Application and selection are based on history of service slash volunteer work, recommendations and writing samples. There were several parts of the program. One was daily lectures. Um, the daily oncology lectures were planned on various topics ranging from basic oncology, clinical radiation, and surgical oncology, healthcare disparities, even statistics and epidemiology. I can let you guess which were the least favored thoughts. But the most loved part of the program was the clinical shadowing. Um, these were students who had not spent any time on the floor, so here was their first time to actually see patients. Um, and they had a full day clinical shadowing with the radiation oncologist, a surgical and medical oncology. So they got to see all three arms of oncology and many of the students so connected with their, their hosts that they went back for multiple additional um, shadowing. Popular aspect was our yearly trip to Washington DC. Um, the last few years, we connected with the National Coalition for Cancer Survivors. We're very happy to have students, and we had a two-day seminar learning about cancer survivors and lobbying. And on the next day, the students went to Capitol Hill and knocked on the doors of their respective senators and representatives to lobby for support for cancer survivorship. This was an incredible opportunity because the students got to see health policy in action. Another major part of the program was each student had a basic science research project. The students were assigned to a laboratory with a senior researcher who acted as a mentor. At the end of the summer, we had a formal scientific seminar where each of the students presented their research. And at the time, they also received their certificate of graduation. Here are just some of the papers from this, from this um, research. And this one is my favorite. This is a perspective piece written by Robert Jones, who was a Cupid alum from 2013 that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Robert was a phenomenal, or is a phenomenal uh, uh, person. He was a medical student by day, and by night, he worked as a resident assistant in a homeless shelter. So he actually lived in a homeless shelter and helped take care of these men. In this article, Robert writes about how the Cupid program, but more importantly, his experience in the homeless shelter, helped him decide on what kind of physician he wanted to be. I recommend that you all find this. It's very easy to find article and read it. It's just beautiful. And I'm, I'm so proud that we had um, Robert with us for a summer. There were some additional perks. Housing was provided free lunches, gym memberships, social activities, and of course the students got a little bit of money um, as part of the um, program. Where were some of our milestones? We started in 2005. It's my first class. We had four students I chose from 30 applicants. One of those four is a radiation oncologist now in Delaware. 
In 2010, we had increased 10 students and we had over 200 applicants. In 2013, we success successfully applied for an R25 to expand the program to make room for students specifically from medical schools that did not have an NCI designated cancer center. And Ohio State opened up a uh, CUPA chapter in 2014. When I joined Indiana University in 2015, we opened another CUPA chapter. And I'm proud to say in 2016, we had close to 300 applications from 123 medical schools. We had a 3.8% acceptance rate. So there's, there is interest. But we decided this long, we should go back and see how well we've done. How many of those students actually went on to select careers in oncology? So again, our hypothesis was basically exposing medical students to oncology early in training will increase interest in oncology fields and successfully match students into oncology specialties. Secondary hypothesis is that later in their careers that they will use their oncology skills to address healthcare disparities. How did we get data? Well, our primary endpoint was students' specialty choice. We surveyed alums. We did internet searches and we compared to national averages. What did we find? Well, between 2005 and 2013, there were 71 medical students from 32 schools completed Cupid. 51% were female, 49% male, 38% URMs. So even though the program was not defined specifically or designed specifically for minority students, we had a healthy participation. Of those 71 medical students, 20 or 28% chose fields associated with oncology. Interestingly, seven of that 20, which is 35%, and nine of that 20, 45%, were URM or females, which are higher than um, those, protect, those groups in oncology as demonstrated in the earlier ASCO slide. The oncology fields were broken down into two general categories, oncology specific or fields that were not oncology specific, but the student is concentrating on oncology within those fields. So with regards to oncology specific, we had five radiation oncologists, which comes to 7%. The national average of medical students who go into on radiation oncology is 1%. EMOC, three, surge on two, urology one, guide on one. So for a total of 12 students or 17% chose oncology specific careers. Now the, the careers that had oncology concentration were pathologists who concentrate in cytopathology, Mohs surgeon, radiologists, specifically mammography, palliative slash hospice care for cancer patients, GI, and we have an infectious disease person who only cares for patients undergoing bone marrow transplant. Well, how does that 17% those oncology specific fields compare to the national average? The green represents our 17% and the red represents the national rate of oncology specialty match. And over the years, it's increased from 4.9 in 2005 up to 6.7 in 2013. And that, when you compare that 16.7 to our 17%, it's, it's pretty remarkable. It's almost a two to three fold increase in our students who chose oncology compared to the national average. So that's our summer program. Are there any other summer, summer programs that show um, a greater preponderance of their students eventually picking that field? There are. Present three here very briefly for you. There was a cardiothoracic surgery program, summer research program, which reported 2.5 to a six-fold increase in their students choosing cardiothoracic surgery over the general medical student population. Vascular surgery reported a three-fold increase in students from their summer research program. And radiology represent, reported a six-fold increase in their students choosing a radiology career from their summer research program compared to the national general student population. 
sounds great. Our numbers are right along with that. But someone who's might say, hey, you know, Rich, that's that's great, but aren't you really just pre-selecting for these students? I mean, they chose your oncology program, so they must have already been inter interested in that. That's a fair criticism, and that's hard to refute, but we'll give it a shot. So here's the data from the AAMC looking at the continuity of specialty preference on the matriculation and the graduation questionnaire. So basically, students are asked at the time of matriculation, what will be your specialty? And when they graduate match, they ask, what is your specialty going to be? And they'll see if there's concordance between what they saw as what they did at matriculation and what they eventually ended up doing. So in the bottom, we can see of 12,000 students that were chosen, only 20 of that were um, surveyed, only 25% or 26% ended up matching in a field that they selected when they started medical school. 49% chose a completely different field, 14% were undecided, 10% um, did not respond to the survey. Here, we look at radiation oncology, and I have radiation oncology because that, from the information that's provided, that is the only oncology specific area. Of 132 students who went into radiation oncology, not a single one had selected that field when they matriculated. 56% chose something completely different, 13% were undecided. There's other data. Here's a study by Canton and all who looked at four years of a medical school. And what they found, looking at radiation oncology again, is that six students at matriculation chose radiation oncology. Six matched. However, only one of those six who matched actually chose radiation oncology at the beginning of medical school. So what they call a retention rate of only 16.6%. Unfortunately, and unfortunately, in their paper, they also don't separate other oncology um, specialties. So what does this information tell us? I think this tells us that medical students are pretty undifferentiated when they start medical school. And with given the right opportunities, we could di differentiate them or lure them to um, fields in, in need. And I think uh, Cupid is an example of that. So in conclusion, uh, Cupid was associated with an increase in student choosing an oncology specialty. Cupid resulted in seemingly higher percentage of URMs and women choosing oncology. The structure of programs like Cupid that expose students to oncology early in their training will play a crucial role in growing a future oncology workforce that is adequate in size and diversity. I'm going to close with this picture because this is my not because we look like we're ready for the next Avenger movie, but um, this is my first Cupid class after I became chair at uh, Indiana University. And I want to point out this next young man who was part of that class. He is a was a fantastic uh, member of our class, and you guys are very lucky to have him with you. With that, I end. Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure and honor to speak to you all. Great, thank you. That was a really wonderful um, overview. And I will ask the first questions because as I hear about the program, um, the first thing that runs through my mind as a chair is how did you fund it? Um, I know you mentioned the R25, but particularly when you're talking about bringing people from outside and providing housing and administrative costs, I mean, it's a costly program. So where was the money? So, to be quite honest, it was um, Hopkins funded it for almost 10 years uh, uh, without any support. And they're still funding it now here, and our cancer center is funding the program here. It really wasn't that expensive. The most, the most expensive thing was the $5,000 stipend. Um, the housing, we put them up in student housing for the medical school. So, we own the housing, so that wasn't terribly expensive. Um, the other big expense was um, the trip to Washington, D.C. Um, so we would pay for the flight. The National Cancer Survivorship Group covered part of the cost to have the students come. So in all, it was, it was, I would 
not that expensive. I'm going to guess our, our first few years for our six or seven students may have been about $45,000. Um, and the, the effort, your effort too, the PI, the, the faculty's efforts. Yeah, so, so we didn't, so this is the, the beauty of, of Johns Hopkins and the beauty of IU. Um, every single faculty member that I asked to help helped. Every single one without hesitation. So when I asked about, hey, can you host a student in the lab? Absolutely rich. We believe in this program. We're going to host a student. Would you give a lecture? Absolutely rich. We'll give a lecture. And I, I am I'm humbled by the by the generosity of my colleagues. Great. Um, and then Nalita has a, a a similar question that actually I have. Um, you talked about how many TPID grads ended in oncology related fields. How many ended up working in underserved areas and specifically fo focusing on healthcare disparities in whatever field they were in? So that's that's the part two of our study. We you know, so even though it's been going on very long, many of our students are just finishing their residency because right? we see them at the at the very beginning. So they have three years of medical school and you know, at least three or four more years of residency. So we're just starting to collect that back. Yeah. And then um, from Farah, amazing presentation, fascinating data on cancer. And then from a treatment standpoint, what more useful markers besides race should we be incorporating to find those people who would benefit from more intense cancer screening treatment interventions? Oh. What other things we sh so what can we do to identify other at risk populations? Well, there's there's a, there's a there's a ton of literature out there about that, but it's really um, really the big ones are any group that is potentially marginalized, and um, and so those would be racial ethnic minorities. Those would be um, socially marginalized, so LGBTQ, transgender. Um, immigrants, um, uh, people who are just getting out of jail. So any marginalized group deserves additional attention. Um, the other question I had is, uh, you know, we talk about um, not having access to oncologists or even physicians in many areas of um, the United States. Um, how do you see, what is, do you see the role of telemedicine to help um, account for that? Do you see that helping in healthcare disparities, or um, are there aspects that can worsen healthcare disparities? Telemedicine is um, something that we've really latched on to because we have a significant uh, uh, rural community here in Indiana. And what we found. Um, is that there are, um, we simply did not have the resources for mental health to have someone physically be at these various places. And you, you know that mental health issues are hand in hand with poverty and hand in hand with uh, disparities. So we, we spent a lot of effort building um, a telemedicine networks, initially starting just for um, mental health. That's, that's gone well. I, don't I I don't um, see it as being the uh, the only answer. I think we're going to be able to have to find ways to reach people on several different platforms and several methods. But certainly telemedicine, I think, is a a potential boon. Great. And then from uh, Christy Bartles, thank you for an outstanding and inspiring presentation. You. Have you had support from ASCO, um, ASCO or, or your professional societies for the program? And um, do you anticipate disseminating this model um, for other specialties or um, in other areas? So um, we presented at we presented at ASCO and Astro, and we presented in a group of uh, oncology. Deans and they've expressed interest, and they were sure to be sure to send medical students our way. Um, I will I will tell you the on the very sort of cynical aspect of it, the the, the funding or the concern really wasn't um, a, a major concern because when the cancer center says, "Hey, 
you know, if you're an NCI designated cancer, you have to show that you're doing something, some kind of outreach for your community. And this program fits right into that, right? They can say that we're taking people who want to address cares, underserved patients, not only in our communities, but in all communities. So it's really part of the oncology mission. And really, when we think about the census and all, it's, it's, it's really um, not that much. Given I, with, with your point well taken that we, that the, the, it was a lot of volunteer work from faculty that covered it. Um, have you thought about uh, developing a similar program at the undergraduate level? Because one of the other challenges to increase the number of UIMs in oncology is really need to increase the number mm -hmm. who are interested in medicine. And um, I'm a big proponent of getting people early, um, high school, college. Your thoughts on that? So, um, no, we have not thought about um, uh, uh, developing something similar in um, undergrads. I do, I have given um, many talks to elementary school, middle school and high school students about the importance of uh, oncology. Um, again, our, our goal um, was not necessarily to increase the number of URMs. Right. Our, our goal for our program is to, to increase the number of people who were sensitive to the needs of the people who are underserved. Um, so that so we have uh, our, my most preferred goal is to actually expand Cupid to other medical schools. Now we, as I mentioned, Ohio has a chapter. Hopkins still has theirs, and um, we have ours in Indiana. And the way that we run our programs is that thanks to the lovely Zoom and other teleconferencing, we all have our lectures together. So the students at Hopkins and at Ohio State in Indiana meet each other electronically for several weeks during these lectures. And then when they actually go to DC, we meet in person. And a, a beautiful, unexpected um, a side effect of this is that um, they sort of develop their own community. Right? These students know each other from different medical schools. They have a common interest in serving the underserved, and they stay in touch with each other long, each, with each other long after Cupid. So that's really um, a pleasant way. So that's how we're hoping to spread the word um, and, and help to address this problem. Yeah, and I guess my other thought on that is, you know, oncology cancer is not the only, um, unfortunately, disease where there are um, Healthcare disparities. Have you thought about doing other disease specific focuses? I mean, I can tell you I'm diabetes. Uh, sure. uh, yeah. No, we haven't. We haven't. To be honest, I've just been concentrating on um, oncology. Yeah. Yeah. Great. But I think this model could work in those other diseases. We, we'd have to get a champion in those other diseases. Yeah. I mean, I see the focus if you, if you want to focus on getting students interested in healthcare disparities regardless of what their ultimate specialty is would be in some ways the uh, the ideal goal absolutely really if we could educate everyone on how how important this is and how um how our actions can influence the outcome of people our unconscious actions can influence the outcomes of people i think um that would be a great improvement great Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank Dr. Zeller so much for your time and sharing of the journey. It really is very inspiring. Um, I think and it's very timely because uh, you may or may not realize today is match day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so our medical students will find their find out their fate today. Oh, have fun. Enjoy. It all Thank works you. out. It always works out. It all it always works out. That's exactly. It always works out. <laughs> Thank right, you well, so much. It's been an honor. Take care. It's great to see you again. I wish you the best. Take care. Bye bye.